So literally Nick like stuck an ice pick in the ground to see if everyone I can't remember how he did it or how it happened, but all I remember is just looking down to see this black hole. Episode 2 guys, welcome back to the White Wolf Podcast. Um, I think we had roughly 115 unique viewers on our last video, so we're really expecting that. We're happy enough. At least 50 times. I, I've been times? stopped in the street a few times, like, really? so yeah, definitely. I didn't even listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I didn't I listen to part of it. You sent me it and then I was, I was busy, so they could see some of it. It's mostly Benji's laugh, from what I remember. Oh. All right. Some good reports. Well, good. Um, we've got Johnny Mort in the podcast today, special guest. Well, Thanks very much, Mort, for coming on. Um, okay. Mort is a crossfitter. Uh, he's also a skydiver, a mountain climber. He's done several adventures throughout Europe, so he's going to chat a wee bit about that. I'm um, looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Some good stories, especially a particular one about an incident that happened at the top of Kilimanjaro. Um, so you'll have to listen to the end <laughs> to get to that one. <laughs> and the serial incident as well, we'll talk about the serial yeah. incident. <laughs> We're taking I was not talking about serial incident. You're talking about the <laughs> not allergy one? The not <laughs> allergy. <laughs> we'll not give it away. Is that what the one? No, but there's a few. The one I probably can't share. You can tell them all, yeah. Right, okay, okay. And you're definitely telling that one now. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's yeah. off um, limits, you know. Okay. Right, Johnny Morton, who's the most famous person you ever met? Oh, um, really? Like, uh, an actress from America. She was in the middle. A oh, show called The Middle. Really famous. Was she famous? It's so famous. No, no, this actress. One. The mom. This, this, are you talking about um, properly, properly met? Yeah. Just who would you consider the Not most famous seen. person that you have had at least, you know, shared a few sentences with? I, I actually can't think. She's the mom, also out of like everyone loves Raymond or something. Is it the mum you're talking about? Googler. Yeah, I can't remember her name, but um, she was on one of the mountaineering trips. So I actually probably got to know her and still be in contact. Um, but in terms of actually just meeting someone, I, I don't think I've ever. Randall Fiennes, I met him about three weeks ago. Well, met him as in. Ralph? It's Ronald? Ronald Fiennes. <laughs> <laughs> is it Ronald? 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 Is it the core? Is that Ronald? No, it's definitely not Ronald. <laughs> Ronald? I think he's right. It's like Ronald or something. It's Ronald. Ronald. But, <laughs> it's Ronald. I certainly could be wrong there. But I, I was Are we talking about Voldemort from Harry Potter? Ronald Fiennes? <laughs> 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 no, I'm talking about this. Why is this funny? <laughs> <laughs> Ronald I'm talking about this adventure. Uh, he's an adventurer. Oh, yes. Ronald Fiennes, oh, he's, he's right. like... <laughs> <laughs> Not Matt Voldemort. Yeah. What's does, he called? Does he, he have a nose? He does. He does have a nose. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Voldemort. It's not Voldemort. Does he have a nose? I don't know what What were the circumstances of that? So he's just he was at the water pump <laughs> and then he was doing a talk there. So Ghost went up to see that and then um, we got to meet him after. Oh, so but, uh, aside from that, I actually can't think of any musically famous. Who have you met that's overly famous? Well, really that's not a competition one, alright. Fairly long list. Princess Anne. Uh, <laughs> you all worked out with Froning? Princess Anne. Prince Froning. Princess Anne. Oh dear. Yeah. Princess Anne. Yeah. I met, oh, I didn't meet. Prince Charles, once in my last job, he came around um, and greeted everyone. So that would probably be the most famous. Mm. We, Andy and I, once partied <laughs> with Luke Evans. Who's yeah. that? He's uh, Bart the Bowman in The Hobbit. He's also in The Fast and Furious. He was Gaston in Beauty and the Beast. I Dracula. Think. He was Dracula. Oh, yes. Dracula. He's in uh, that new one with Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston as well. Yeah, right. basically he was shooting a movie in Belfast, we were extras on it, years ago, Dracula. And he was staying in a house in the Malone Road, so we ended up at an after party. He still got his boxers? In his kitchen. <laughs> 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 we're going there. We're going there. Yep, yeah, it's a dude. <laughs> so, you actually no, have boxers? Can I ask you why, France? I only wear them in powerlifting meets. They're my life. <laughs> The honest truth. <laughs> why have you got his boxers or his wife ones? What are you doing? Um, my friend needed to get with him. Here's a story. Our mate, one of the other main actors in the film, fancied our mate and asked her back to their house for an after party. 
and then we messaged her and was like get us the address and she's like sent it to us and we rocked up and there's these big gates and we pushed the button and then luke evans comes running out you know had a few drinks <laughs> and let us in we're all best mates mm -hmm. got into his house it was us him her all the main actors and like the director and a few other important folk yeah. and just had this big after party in this big huge house and then i was like flip no one's gonna believe me. I need a souvenir. <laughs> so how do people know that those white fronts don't well, they, they don't believe you like? They don't like yeah. <laughs> Obviously this was just my train of thought. And there's a <laughs> this wash you basket was sitting there with all of this <laughs> fresh laundry and I was like, I need a souvenir. Are you sure it was fresh? <laughs> <laughs> like the wee pair of his They're not fresh anymore after you've worn them at all in your powerlifting. Ah, like, oh, dear. Mm. Why do wait away from help with powerlifting? You can't. You have to wear. It's the re regulations. You have to wear. Wait, I didn't know really? you about your wife fronts. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Unless it's you. Do I have a wee gander? Oh, I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the regulations. That's weird. Yeah. How dare you tell me what to wear? There, there's your coffee. Well, that's, uh, Anybody else? Anyone, take anyone the famous? Thanks. No? Mm. Robert Pattinson. Mm -hmm. Met Charlie Hunnam, Robert Pattinson. Me? Did you not face Sienna Miller on Picnic? Oh yeah. Probably. I did, yeah. Well, that's more famous than Robert Pattinson. I had a star in her eyes. Oh. On nice. a Picnic. Huh. Doesn't sound weird at all. <laughs> well, it was weird for me, because Sienna Miller. You know? Yeah, that could be so much better than last week's. Is it? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Last week's terrible. Let me try a bit because I, I was worried it was going to go like, through all that faff and then everyone be like, yeah, that's stinking. No, it's far better. Mm -hmm. Right, Johnny Morton, um, tell us a wee bit about your adventures. Uh, as I said there, you've been to Mont Blanc, you've been to Kilimanjaro, uh, you've done a lot of skydiving, mountain climbing. What sort of got you into the whole skydiving scene? Uh, yeah, so we all knew each other from school. Uh, Benji sort of lived on the scene, but <laughs> why are you laughing at that? <laughs> I just know what you're like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we we knew for sure for years, so it was it was us that started this. So we would have went up in the mornings you all the time. Started skydiving. Oh my God. No. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> no, it was us hey, that started. Like, you're the, the most famous person I've ever met. <laughs> 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 she, yeah. <laughs> go on, go on. I don't even want to talk now. But um, no, so. We we started off going. Um, you should probably tell me as, as much in terms of the, like how we started. It was <coughs> the mornings. Is that it? It's not parkour. Was start first. Parkour. And parkour and then skating and all sorts of things. But it was the mornings parkour. and then we added up to <laughs> the indoor parkour. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then rock climbing. Yeah, yeah. I started rock climbing and then just the mornings. Not that it got boring, but you just wanted to get bigger mountain stuff. And then went the the Highlands in Scotland for a bit and then. I was with Nick Derrins and then it was me and him that went to the Alps, climbed Mont Blanc and a few other ones. And then just with that it started what other ones would be interesting. <coughs> but in fairness, the ones I've done are just very commercial, commercialised and easily um, accessible and, mm. and stuff like that. So that's kind of the reason why I've done them. Um, when you say that, the like of Mont Blanc, that was probably the first big challenge that you took on. Yeah, that was, at the time that was unbelievable and that was something that, um, yeah, that, to me, felt incredible at the time. I've seen, I've seen now a lot of people have done it, and it's quite, it is quite commercialised and, is and all, but sure, people say that about Everest now too. You so say like commercialised, it doesn't take away how challenging it is, you know? No, it, well, there's... It's probably weeks. a good thing in terms of safety that's commercialised. Yeah, well, two weeks it's after... accessible to a lot yeah, of people, it's but still it's still really, dangerous. really hard. It's still very dangerous. Two weeks after, yeah. um, after we came back, there was nine people died in a lot of things. Um, I went down a crevasse mm. that Darren had pulled me out of. Nick pulled me out a lot um, and things, so there was a lot of risk with it too. But um, so when you went down a crevasse, you basically you're walking up Mont Blanc. Motley. The majority of this friendship circle is. What, what's the difference between a crevice and a crevasse? I don't know who said it wrong now. You've got <laughs> definitely you, definitely you. <laughs> right. Close yourself. It is a crevice. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I think you can say it. A crevice? When you're yeah. in the Joker, come in there. <laughs> <laughs> Fendi's a wee bit wheezy from last night's <laughs> open attempt. Um, no, but when you're climbing Mont Blanc, you're in a group of what, four or five, and you're all linked together via rope. And yeah, there's three of us. So it was a guide um, from Ballyclare, 
and he was over there working Chamonix, and then there was me and then Nick <laughs> all worked together. <laughs> Why is this funny? <laughs> I'm still getting over the plan for the other thing, right? Go. What do you think of this crevasse or crevice? It doesn't matter. Crevasse, let's go with crevice. I would say crevasse. No, here's our go. So, yeah, we were walking up. Um, it was actually on the way down that I went into it, but it was, we were walking down, and there's sort of like a, a trail has been made um, from your path up. So, there's a lot of people following that. Um, and there's a Spanish <laughs> there's a Spanish group coming up, um, and obviously they're getting it tighter because they're on the way up. So I stepped off the path, you told me not to, and I stepped off the path. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Classic. Um, you need to swap seats away from them. Yeah, I stepped off that and um, it stood on this. It looked it's snow covered at the time, but it just opened up and it was, uh, it was this black hole and I went down into that. And then Attached to other people? Attached to so the guy. So you started to pull them down or what happened? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they opened the, the guy at the back, basically against the anchor. Yeah, so Nick had to lean back and, yeah, and, and hold it and then he pulled me out. Um, and Nick all was at the back? Yeah. So literally Nick, like, stuck an ice pick in the ground to save everyone. I can't remember how he did it or how it happened, but all I remember is just looking down to see this black hole, and obviously realised what it was, and then... And were you he hanging on me. a rope over a hole? I wasn't hanging as such, I was basically waist height, mm. and sort of had my elbows on the, so the other side. instinctively yeah. grab an edge somewhere yeah. or something yeah. and be kind of hanging? But you're in crampons and stuff, and you're panicking, you're kicking, yeah. and then he just helped pull out. But I remember coming out of it and it was, I, I assume that my first experience of shock was like, you know in a movie when a bomb goes off and there's like a ringing? Yeah. It's that kind of noise, so it, was, it kind of felt like that. And I remember, like, it felt like it was in the distance, but he was right beside me. It was my guy shouting and swearing at me for stepping off the path. Um, but to me, it was just like numb and then went on down. <coughs> Were you not uh, sick or something at the time? Or was that a different story? No, I was killing my general. I actually got away really lightly with altitude and stuff in Mont Blanc, considering my first time being proper proper height. But um, Nick got hit a bit on the top, and um, so he just wanted to get down quick. But no, one Do, can you remember like the stats of Mont Blanc for anyone who isn't familiar with it in terms of? Uh, I think it's close to it's four hundred or four thousand eight hundred meters, somewhere around that. Um, it's obviously the highest in well, it's the highest in what's Donner like a thousand. Not that was 842. 842. So it's about 4,000 um, meters higher than that, but hmm. it's technically not the highest in Europe. Um, it depends where you look or what you research, but Mount Elbrus um, near Russia is the highest. Um, and why, why is that then? Is that because it's just like, is that in Europe? Yeah, it's on sort of the, on the border, I think. And then people seem to hit it and some don't, but certainly it's the highest in um, the Alps. On there, so you're saying you legally have to hire a sherpa to take you up the mountain? Yeah, just rock up like I couldn't say for sure what the restriction things are, but um, certainly the easiest method um, is to go through a company. Um, like I say, it's really commercialized, so a lot of people are sort of um, taking control of that market and make money off it. So I went through this company, um, I went out on my own, traveled out, and then once I was out there, met with a group of about 10. So there was, I think it was 10 of us and something ridiculous, like 30 guides, or 30 Sherpas as such. For um, a group of 10? Orders, the, yeah. 30 Sherpas. Do they yeah. carry all your... So they go, they're stuff. unbelievable. They go ahead, like these huge bags um, on their head, mm-hmm. and they're just climbing up the mountain ahead of you, and some of them are practically sprinting. And I left. I ended up leaving my boots and kit because their kit was horrendous. I remember being on the summit where I was in all my Gucci kit, all layered up warm. One of the boys had no toe in his boot. This is like minus, I think it was like minus 20 or something ridiculous. You know, to you, it also shocks and things, but... Um, See, I, I would, I have always assumed that Kilimanjaro was a warm climate. <laughs> well, it's like, uh, it's like height, anywhere, if you go up high enough, it's 5,000 something meters. the majority of that been warm, though? Hmm? Would the majority of that been warm? Yeah, that was incredible in terms of, you went from, like, desert, well, not desert, but it's the Serengeti, essentially. So that kind of um, environment, then it became... Which, where is it exactly? It's Tanzania. Tanzania. Um, I don't think it's not too far That's off. That's down south-ish Africa? South right. east, yeah. South east. Yeah, yeah south east. So the flight <laughs> there was, um, was good to fly, I flew into the Middle East and then got another flight down. But um, the best thing about that was meeting those people. So I went into a group of 10 people. I think there was a, one was an actress, one was a doctor, one was a nurse, um, one was a, royal, or a US Marine. So just all this range of 
different people. Most people on their own going solo, was it? Or was no, 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 most people are actually, there was a lot of couples and a lot of people, well, it was probably about sort of 50-50. Um, huh. There was Lan, who was a always oh, Asian girl, and then um, another fella who was just sort of in the same boat as me, just trying to figure things out in life, go and explore and adventure, and, and yeah, go with that. So um, meeting them was incredible. Um, I actually feel guilty. They tried to, they try to keep, it, they try to keep in touch better, and I try to keep in touch with them, and regret that because sort of have lost a um, wee bit of contact with them. But yeah, I'm sure they'll be happy to pick it up, and I'm sure they keen to come over to Ireland and see the country and stuff. So maybe use that as an excuse. But um, that was the best part of that trip. The mountain itself wasn't overly challenging, but to do it with them and have that experience was incredible because they had their own wee blogs and different things going on um, at the time. So I got to be part of that, and that was fun. There's definitely something about going through a lot of pain with people and how that sort of forges bonds of friendship. Yeah. yeah. I think I was at 21 at the time, so yeah. relatively young. Now I feel like I should have done a lot, a lot younger than finances and stuff would have been an issue. But yeah, um, I was relatively young and um, it was a whole new experience. Never been to that kind of. We'd been to North Africa, obviously, with the cycle and things, but. Never been to that part of Africa and went to Serengeti after and things, so it was incredible mm. to see. But yeah, um, yeah. So so you've uh, you've a pretty crazy allergy to peanuts. I do. Um, to the point when if you had a peanut, there's a strong chance that you could probably die. Well, we're going to possible anaphylactic shock. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you had a can we call it a near death experience on the top of Kilimanjaro? Or talk yeah. us through what what sort of happened there. It felt like it to me, and um, one of the girls on the trip was a doctor, and when she looked quite panicky, that's quite worrying when the doctor's quite panicked, but basically it was, I think it was the night before summit night, um, so obviously that's a big person's summit uh, the next day, early in the morning, and um, we were getting beef and banana stew, which is just a dish that the porters cooked up for you. So you're in a mess tent, which is totally alien to like some alpine climbing where you carry all your own kit. We're in a mess tent that they set up, and then we got banana, beef and banana stew, um, and allegedly I hadn't put it on the form that I had this allergy. That's the day I told you. That was the cover all anyway um, for them. But um, so Did show you the form. Just snipped out. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> square. <laughs> so they had. Um, Give me this with peanut butter in it, and I had that, and instantly knew the reaction would have felt like it was burning in my throat. Um, and then that was the first time I got to use the the pen, so it was quite a, a cool thing to try. You can imagine like, more actually being quite excited. <laughs> I can't really use that pen. Well, you got to see what it feels like, and it was good to see what it feels like because I know now what it is like and what I experience. But what what the basically it's like? just an adrenaline rush, so it's um, it overcomes that. And then um, I, the doctor had different things, I took part and things, but. Um, so you administer your own heavy pen. Yeah, um, I remember the US Marines. Actually, I'm terrible with needles. So I remember looking at like looking at the leg, looking at that, and then the US Marine guy was there, and he's like, "What are you doing, man? Do it!" Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just sign yourself up. Yeah, uh, Justin, you call him. He's cool, but um, yeah, he, he's just like, "What are, what are you looking out for?" But uh, I did that, and then I was just had this adrenaline rush. So everyone else went to bed, obviously early to get up for the summit. Um, day, and I was just awake. More student and hill sprints at three yeah. in the morning. <laughs> 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 he actually ran down. Thing, <laughs> <and> <laughs> <just> <laughs> down. <laughs> but the uh, the best part of that was the next day on the way down, they gave the porters as almost like an apology, gave me a joint um, because I was, I was huge in, in in that sort of culture. So they gave me a joint and. Um, yeah, uh, yeah the basically. Or, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> or the bus ride home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know the legality over there, but um, it was rife anyway, so they did ever. So um, I remember sitting, I have a photo of some like it anyway, but um, I remember sitting on, uh, beside my tent in this high altitude sleeping bag, really warm, cozy, above the mountains, or above the clouds, sorry, on the mountain. So sitting above the clouds and watching like a lightning storm in the clouds below um, while having the smoke of this stuff. So I listened to, I think we was sleeping at last. So it was like an unbelievable experience. Saturn, sleeping at last Saturn, is that so? Mike Adams alone. Yeah, so um, Mike Adams, man. every time I listen to Saturn, it reminds me of just like 
<laughs> sitting on that mine wow. on top of clouds in a, a thunderstorm, so I was quite amazing. I didn't know you could actually sit on clouds, so I thought that was just in cartoons. Yeah. yeah. They can sit up there, yeah. and sitting on the mountains. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> you were quite into like Instagram and stuff at that stage. Yeah. But that was that was a little fair while ago when it was all kind of kicking off. But you, you'd be one of the early adopters, sort of, of that kind of... Instead. Yeah, I don't know where I'd be now if I stayed on it, but um, so you were getting sponsored and stuff. Yeah, at one stage off Instagram. There were companies called Snook, which were make these they're for rock climbers with like comfy flip flop sandal conversions. Um, you talking about six, seven years ago, or or am I? Eight, eight. I was about twelve. Well, no, I was about twenty-one, twenty. So what was it been eight, that? eight years ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the year for you were building up momentum, and then you just decided to knock it in the head and delete it. Yeah, that's standard um, with phases and everything else. But um, do you regret that, or I go for a while after. Sometimes regret it, but I don't know. Obviously, I'm past that now, so it's it's fine. But um, you're beyond Instagram. Right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you see like sixteen year old kids breaking in thirty k a month yeah. on Instagram. How do you feel? Yeah, well, that would be nice. <laughs> but, um, I'm, I'm still on Instagram, which got a wee sneaky account no one knows about. It's just uh, like I've stopped them interested in. Mm-hmm. Well, now we all do. <laughs> yeah. um, I suppose your, re- your reasons for it were fairly noble for getting off social media. Yeah. Was, saying about it became less about the traveling and the adventuring and more about I need to get from A to B to get a photo. I think, yeah, one of the turning points was whenever I, was, I drove to Dingle. Um, so I got out of work on a Friday, drove to Dingle, which was six hours or something on my own. Um, one of the best places in Ireland. It's I reckon. amazing, but it's better to share it with people. But I drove my, my own and slept in the boot of a Seat Leon, which isn't that big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, like, especially for you. It's <laughs> curled up. No, no, like lower the seats okay. and then lay through. I think my feet were between basically the, the front seats um, <laughs> over the gear stick. And then the I was in the boot and it was an angle, so it blows around the head. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd brought down like some ridiculous trying to come through some like six pillows and two day beds and all and it was still freezing. You didn't actually fall asleep that night, you passed out. But I think when I did that and I woke up and just to get photos, I was awake about six in the morning to get sunrise photos and things and I'm doing all that. I was like, this isn't fun at all and I'm just doing this for a photo um, and when you're driving Six hours was well, basically twelve hours within a twenty-four hour period on your own. You kind of get plenty of time to think about that. And then I knew if if I didn't delete it, I would always go back to it. So that was the only way I could sort of discipline myself to this by cutting it off. Totally, so that worked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, you've done your first year of mountain climbing. Um. Tell us a wee bit about the skydiving then. How you get into that? You started off in the wild geese. Is that right? No, no. started off in Madrid. Um, so me and my father, Alan McCune, he hated it, um, but there was a course called Accelerated Freefall. So a lot of people do maybe a tandem to experience it, or they would do a, a static line course, which is very slow progressions, and you would jump out of the plane, and your parachute would open automatically. But the best or quickest way is a AFF, Accelerated Freefall course, which is seven jumps, essentially, if you do everything right. And you could do that within a couple of days, and that's you qualified. So you do ground school for one day, and then you do two or three days. It's going to be three in total, so two days of jumping. And you'll fall with an instructor. You never jump with them or toss them, but you fall with an instructor. And you do different maneuvers and moves and things in the air, and then they'll fly into you. Um, For example, for the first few ones, and then you fall. But obviously, if you- What do you mean they fly into you? As in, they'll fly to you, grab onto you. You ever see skydivers with it? It's like we foam things here, they're grips for that. Right. So they'll hold on to you, you have to do the drills, and then you'll pull your parachute. Obviously, they'll let go, and then they'll pull theirs. They do that until you get progressively better, and then by the seventh jump, you're essentially falling on your own, doing backflips, doing different turns, and all to prove you can control yourself, and then you'll pull, and that's you on your own, qualified. So when I heard about this, is like this. I knew I wanted to progress that sport and go with that. And that was um, the quickest way to get that was the best to way. that point. Yeah, it was still expensive. I think it was a couple of grand, but me and the fella Alan McCune I used to work with went out. He was sort of cool <laughs> at the time. And when we did that, um, we are qualified. He just didn't enjoy it. I think he just realized that he didn't like heights <laughs> that much. Halfway through his first job. I'm not a so, fan. So that was him. No. But I, um, I, I absolutely loved it. And 
still today, even though I haven't jumped since February 2017, but that's because of different things in life um, sort of take me away How from How many that. jumps have you done in your life? So I've done 104, which sounds, I think, a lot to a lot of people, but 104 in, in actual skydiving as a sport terms isn't that much. It's, it's yeah, you'd be still considered pretty amateur, but um, it's just it's an expensive, expensive thing to do. So um, over here with the weather too. Yeah, the weather is a huge part of it, and that's why I would go abroad. But you can get you can go abroad quite for quite cheap. You get a cheap flight um, somewhere in Europe, Spain or somewhere, and um, they'll just have the planes on rotation. So you just jump on a plane and do that. So um, the big thirtieth is coming up next year. So it's my plans to save a bit of money for that. Um, and um, kick that off again and see how that goes. What about the, the like skydiving culture and stuff? Yeah, it's like? it's quite like it's quite like rock climbing. Um, it's sort of like dirt bag skydivers who so live in their sort of car vans and stuff beside the drop zone and, and do it that way. So that was all quite familiar um, to it. But a picture in a sort of hippie like <clears throat> character. Yeah, it is and it isn't. You get that too. There's people that devote their life to it, and then they become almost like that just to save money and what it is. But skydiving is a bit more expensive than rock climbing. Yeah. Right? So yeah, because it's more expensive, you do get yeah more wealthy people. There's a lot of like doctors into it. And so what are you talking like thirty quid a jump when you're qualified? Sixty quid a jump? It all depends, but generally, so if you're renting a parachute, you pay more. So I think it was something like close to forty-five, fifty pound to jump, rent the parachute, and have someone pack it. Um, once you pack it, that drops a fiver. Once you buy your own parachute, I think it drops maybe 10, 15. Um, and then you buy in bulk to get even less. So I think you can get it down to about 21 pound a jump. But what are you talking for a parachute? Four or five grand? Yeah, brand new, about six, six and a half grand, yeah. Because you have to buy... For a bed Well, there's so much to it. There's, <laughs> <laughs> there's um, the actual parachute, and then there's a reserve, and then there's a AAD, it's called automatic activation device, something like that, um, where it basically will cut your, your main parachute and open your reserve if you get too low. So if you knock and yourself out. connected I, to a uh, watch? No, no, it's connected to your parachute, so it'll be an altimeter in it. Oh, See, I always wondered about that. Like, what if you do your first skydive and then you realize you're scared of heights, pass out halfway down, can't pull your thing and you just go splat. Well, you should never be that doing a skydive on your own for the first well, time. Well, sorry, but, you know. <laughs> but, um, I saw a good ad for a second hand parachute the other day. <laughs> No stains? It never been opened, but had a slight stain. Small stain? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your research for this podcast? Okay. <laughs> it's been waiting for us for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you had a, a skydiving slash base jumping trip to Utah in the States? Yeah. Um, I actually I documented the other trips more so than this, and I wish I did, because this was unbelievable, this trip. so. I went out and... What, uh, what's the difference then for anyone who doesn't know between skydiving and base jumping? So base stands for building <laughs> antenna span as in bridge or earth. So obviously skydiving is from a helicopter or a plane or a balloon um, at, a lot, at much higher heights. So you have longer free fall so you get the opportunity to go to your reserve if something happens. You have a lot more time to think, a lot more time to do stuff. Base is usually a lot lower. Um, and you have a lot less time, you don't even uh, have a reserve on your parachute, so um, there's a lot more risk to it, but um, I think it's more of a more of a sort of kick from it. Um, it's essentially, let's pick the most dangerous way, because it's more thrilling. What's the death rate, do you know? No, but it's huge. Um, I remember when I went to Utah, um, I went to this drop zone in Moab. So Moab is this wee, I think it's, I'd say it's a town, probably close to the village. It's, it's very small, but it's just a mecca for outdoors. So. Loads of mountain bikers, rock climbers, base jumpers, all sorts. It's unbelievable. Utah, is that what Blue John Canyon? Is that what it's called? Oh, uh, there's loaded there's the, things. The, you know the place, the movie, 127 hours? Yeah, I remember going to that That's spot. Utah, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if anyone's seen the movie, 127 hours, where... Yeah, that's what it looks like. Your man gets his arm caught in a rock and he has to, after whatever, four days, ends up with a rusty pen knife cutting off his arm. It's the same territory as where you went. Yeah. Anyone, so. So Moab's, Moab's incredible. It's so we have a Burning Man vibe um, to it. These like tuned up cars, like hot rods and things. It's, it's, so it's incredible. But basically, I met skydivers at the drops in there. Again, I went over on my own. Um, um, that caused me to be more out there because you're on your own. You're not sort of keeping your own group, so you're more out there, and it's, it's a great way to meet people. But I went over and 
think I'd to save money, I rented a Chevrolet Spark. So this is this tiny car, probably close to a car, if even that big. <coughs> and my plan was to sleep, sleep in the boot for two weeks. So <laughs> <laughs> I, told, I told the, the car your first experience was so good. Yeah, exactly. like, why not? I told the car hire company um, <laughs> that's what my plans were, and they kindly upgraded. Um, I don't know if the accent helped, but they kindly upgraded um, to uh, Saloon or something, so that changed things. But, Met the, within a couple of days, I met the skaters there. Um, a lot of the workers lived in a house, a pen, through the pilot, and then all the tandem instructors and different things lived in a house on the ten of them. One of them who happened to pack a parachute, um, which is quite mad, but he was, I think, a heroin addict, something like that. So, I mean, so you really you fueling, this fueling, fueling is a <laughs> so why just, I won't do skydiving. But he had the, <laughs> the, the actual parachute, <laughs> he's shooting up before. <laughs> so, it is, does he use the lines to tie his arm up? He doesn't. <laughs> but he was um, paranoid then about people in the house. I don't know exactly what. I never really talked to him. He was quite hard to put That would be the hell of a paranoid problem. Yes, so so yeah, but he slapped in his car. <laughs> Um, so Again, no surprise there. He sat in his car <laughs> and I got to sleep in his bed. So I stayed with these guys, and I used to go up maybe five or six in the morning with them to up um, on top of cliffs in Utah, and they would do base jumps off. And uh, well, what's that? And then you did a tandem base jump. Yeah. So Steph Davis, who we would have watched videos of when we were younger, climbing. She's a famous rock climber. Um, <clears throat> I met her through that, and she, her husband, um, was basically doing tandem bass and this was something that he had developed. He had developed gear for bass initially because it used to be just normal parachutes but then he developed it to be more bass what specific. Um, I can't believe I forgot it because it's such an impact on my life so I'm, I'm not too Yuri? sure. Yeah. No, no. No? That's, no, that's my dog. They know where here. You sure? Yeah. She was Mario. Yes, Mario was on. No one else. You're here close to Yuri. Almost. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think Yuri? So no one else had done a tandem base from Ireland or the UK, and he was sort of selling it that way. So I went, I went up with him. Um, Pariat Mesa, you call the the sort of sand spar tower thing. Um, it's called Pariat Mesa, and we climbed up there. So I actually had a rock climb to get on top of it. So I was doing that with Steph Davis, which was incredible because mm. we watched her and. Um, she was in those. What do you call the videos? Do you remember? There's like they're all we like rock reels or something. There was like we. Uh, they were yeah, all we clips. Uh, we used to buy DVDs at Cotswold. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. Do you remember her uh, and Dean climbing like out of crack? Yes, he was trying for you. Just needed. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was basically like identical to that. Really? Obviously not as hard, anywhere near as hard, but that type of thing. So, um, I climbed. Oh, well, climbed up on this thing and then did the tandem with him. Um, and then he died about. A couple of months later, um, flying his wingsuit in, so I think it was the Alps, mm. somewhere in Europe, Italy, I don't know. Um, so basically, him and his wife, Steph, were flying together. She had went ahead of him, landed, and turned around, and he wasn't there. And they had to send up a, a mountain rescue team mm. and find his body, so it's pretty horrible for her. But yeah. but uh, right. When you were in Utah, you mean you ended up staying in that house with, what, 10 people? Yeah, so they let me stay and they were just absolutely incredible people. Um, I still follow, so if they probably not know because it's a wee hidden Instagram, I follow them then. And they're still at it, a lot of the ones are alive. A lot of them aren't alive, unfortunately. I think, yeah, there was about 12 in that sort of general group. I think maybe, I don't know now, but at the time maybe five of them had died over the next, over a couple of years after that. Years. Um, just and there's some of the most the risk involved in base jumping. Yeah, it was all base jumping accidents. Was or, or every suit. Yeah, every single one was base. Well, I remember, base, like yeah. for the year or two after, anytime you heard of someone a big name dying, you always said, "Oh, I was I was skydiving mm. with him, like in Utah." Yeah, that's the thing. With skydiving, it's quite a, a small community almost. Um, so you do kind of bump into people that are YouTube famous. Like these guys were all on YouTube and would have big followings and stuff, but. Um, this is the thing with this sport, and this is the thing that is really attractive about it. Like that was what six years ago, maybe, and um, every single individual one of them still sticks in my mind because of their like sort of the way they lived. They were just they were just so in the moment and so um, alive, is the only way I could describe it. And they just loved it, and um, that's that's why they do that sport because obviously they know their life. Nine minutes, so they just live so a really what, what do you think fulfilled in my opinion. 
for them? You know, did you see like a type in terms of personality or whatever? <laughs> no, that's, no, there's no personality. That's to say, like doctors do it. A lot of people are like, it takes a meticulous person to do that more safe than not because you have to be meticulous about your packing. Mm -hmm. You have to pack it properly. You have to be really, really um, sure that everything's right because when I packed my first parachute, it took seven seconds to open. So seven seconds in free fall is a long, long time. <clears throat> And that's because I packed it early. Yeah, a lot of time to think, is this going to open? Yeah, um, basically it comes up in a ball. So it came up in a ball, and then the ball would gradually start spreading out and getting wider and wider until it fully opens. But um, you get malfunctions, which is just where it stays in the ball. So obviously that was a scary time. But um, How fast or how far can you fall in seven seconds then? Well, you do you get the taught this in training, but I, I, I would be lying if I told you so. so you're probably full at like. There's a, there's only really, like, you only reach a certain speed. And then so, you, and you mean it's just like terminal velocity or something. So yeah, you're yeah. probably after that. So you work out very easily. You just work out whatever terminal velocity is. Or do you, you're doing, so you're doing on average, it takes one second to fall 200 feet. It takes a bit of time to accelerate up to what's called your terminal velocity. This is the fastest speed you'll fall at during your jumping is typically around 120 miles an hour. So you're probably already <clears> at that, but should you be at that before, that, before you open your thing? So if you're hitting 120 miles an hour, falling. You can get faster than terminal velocity by reducing resistance. So if you go head down, Aye. um, you can get you can pick up the speed. But, but then it's going to be at terminal velocity. Then though, surely not. If there's if there's resistance there, you're not technically at because it's terminal velocity, not a specific. Or am I talking like I know? About this? <laughs> you know more about me, obviously. I don't have a clue about this. Twenty miles an hour terminal velocity. You're right. There's a guy on YouTube does experiments with that, and he, you know, the way you drop an ant and it's like fallen five hundred times its height, it just hits the ground, and walks off. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is they re their terminal velocity can't get doesn't them. outweigh the something to do with their mass, so they can't the gravity, yeah, yeah, yeah. The gravity yeah. like they can't kill an ant by dropping it, basically. Yeah. From any head. That's that's what that the yeah. video I watched concluded. You drop it off the that's top. That's crazy. Of ice, that's unbelievable. And it just walks off. Mm. <laughs> what a sick man testing that out. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how far he got to realize <laughs> this is how far it stops before you can drop it off the building and it doesn't die. You, know I mean? you sure it wasn't a different ant? He dropped it like 200 feet. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? <was> <laughs> mm. um, what was I, I was going to say? The. I forgot. Glass doors. That was pointless. Really, really good podcast job. Really when you, you were with then? those guys in Utah, I mean, was there any point when you all sat together and discussed the possibility of death? Like, surely they'd seen previous friends of theirs die. No, well, that's, kind of that's, the thing, no, that's the thing about living, like, the way they did is that everyone knows that, everyone is, everyone's obviously aware of that, the death side of things. Um, I remember being there with Kevin Chirico, um, was one of the instructors there, and he, um, they, them guys looked after me so well there, it was unreal, um, their hospitality was amazing, and I, it's something that I would love to give back to them if they ever came here, um, and that's why I feel guilty for not keeping them the way I did, but, um, he, I remember one of his mates dying, like he basically found out either on social media or on the internet and there's a, there's a base fatality list, so a list gets posted, or all, as soon as basically you find out someone has died, whoever knows, knows them, it'll post this on that list, so he found out there and I remember him being almost relieved it was, it was, a, it was a mate but it wasn't a close mate, I remember him being relieved because it wasn't who he thought it was, but that was it, he just, he didn't grieve or such, he just he accepted that and moved on and that's the whole thing with it. They don't think about it, there's no point in thinking about it. Mm. It's there, they know it, they accept that, but the thrill they get and then the sort of it's like anything, it's just like a, a distraction from life in ways and and something that they do for a, a release and a buzz, but mm. they certainly live in the present more than anyone else I've ever ever met. So that's mm. you know, a lot of attraction to that sport. Mm. I can understand that. So there's no obviously there's no fear of death kind of thing. No, that's, that I'll be a lie to say it. there's absolute fear. Right. Same with most skydivers, most people. That's, yeah, there's fear of course. Um, I was up with a boy who was doing his first first or second base jump and he was properly psyching himself up for it. Um, but it's like anything, it's like whenever you go into a workout. Check the angle and that make sure more just in the seat. <coughs> just touch the screen. Yeah, I mean I'm, I'm going to shift it slightly just. Right, go ahead, yeah. It's better there. It's like it's like a workout. When you before you go to do a workout, a lot of the time you're not up for it. A lot of the time you're anxious about it, or you it's it's not worry worry. I wouldn't say worry is the right word, but you know what I mean. You're not keen for it. Um, but when you do it after, you feel great, yeah. and that's what keeps you going back to it. 
and um, otherwise you wouldn't. There's no risk of me dying doing wall balls. No, of course, but yeah, of <laughs> course. It's a different. Right, <laughs> I thought I was going to die yesterday, but like, I, there was yeah. probably no risk of it really happening. Yeah, obviously everyone as an individual has like a threshold for fear mm -hmm. and risk reward and all that stuff. Yours yeah. is obviously the closer you spend higher. to that threshold, the further you're willing to push yeah. it. Yeah, the further That's you need to push it to get. Like, is there a point when you have you ever skydived and got bored halfway down and thought, I no. need to now? People don't understand the, the depth to skydiving. People think it's just falling and that's it. But it's almost like a dance or an art. It's You have to use your body against the wind to turn you, direct you. And it's really difficult. It's way harder than it looks. But So you, you do different sports. So there's like free flying, which would be almost like gymnastics in the sky, which you, you're doing turns and head down and things. There's relative flying, where you'll fly together and you'll do formations. You see them link up together. There's canopy flying, which is which is amazing. That's something I probably will will go down. Um, Aaron Cosby, who goes to this gym, he um, is brilliant at canopy flying. Um, at swooping, super. That sounds dangerous, canopy flying. Like. It is. It, yeah. What, what's that? Um, Let's describe it. So it's basically you downsize the better you get. Well, if you want to, I suppose. Um, but you downsize your canopy. So I, I'm quite a large parachute. Um, the canopy's quite big. But you downsize it smaller and smaller. The smaller you get, the faster it is and the more it'll respond to your input. Um, so for sweeping, which is part of a canopy piloting, is basically you'll have the parachute above you, you'll turn it and hook it, it's called hooking, so you'll bring the parachute so it's, you're basically um, diving it and you'll come down and they can reach mad speeds, I'd say close to um, 80, 90 mile an hour, coming down vertical under the parachute. At the last minute they'll hook it at the bottom and bring them horizontal so we'll change the momentum from vertical to horizontal and we'll cover a load of ground um, accurately. But yeah, there's always a risk of misjudging that. You misjudge that, you're going to break well, everything. The, yeah. the sport in that is how far you can go horizontal then, is it? Like yeah, well, there will be competitions yeah, for that um, and different things, but just the buzz in itself is enough mm -hmm. and that's incredible. Um, and then there's, so there's canopy pilot and relative flan, free flan, there's wingsuit flan, there's um, sky surfing, which is pretty much like a snowboard. And you use that against the wind. Um, there's all sorts, so there's so much to the sport um, that you can do, and that's what's incredible over too. But no, you don't get bored. Well, I haven't got bored. Do you find it puts you in flow state a lot? You know, in your mind, like you forget the time's passing. You're so focused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably more so than anything. Mm. But you don't realize it at the time. Maybe if you want to describe close to it, that's what Ben's used to Yeah, I'm going to go pee. Everyone's probably experienced it at some stage without realizing it. It's like when you're you're focusing on something so much that everything around you kind of disappears or becomes irrelevant. Time passes and you might not necessarily notice. Yeah. Even like watching a really good movie or something, you know, when you're so involved in it, yeah. you just don't realize that. Time's passing. Getting lost in a good book. Yeah, lost in a good book. So, I think I, I've read a wee bit about it before, and one of the first researchers of it was some guy, might have been a psychologist possibly, and I think he was actually climbing a mountain, and then he fell like down some sort of steep uh, hill or whatever it was, and so he was sort of tumbling down and all, and then in that moment he experienced what he then coined as flow state, which time slowing down and his like ability to react. It was like he was normal reaction speed, but everything else had slowed down. Um, so that sort of, it was a novel experience for him. And then he tried to, to study it and stuff. And then from there, it's been a lot more studied. Um, and like people studying what conditions will bring that out. And one of the big things is, is danger, which was obviously in that case of him falling down. So that's why things like skydiving and also surfing is a big one because you have danger so your body's forced to react in that way um, so that's probably why a lot of those sort of dangerous activities are very addictive for people too because you're reaching low state and it's like strong legs there yeah like we would get it frequently rock climbing and stuff particularly remember the El Charo trip we went on yeah that was cool um, which we did what's called via ferrata which is basically <laughs> <laughs> I have an image of him crawling up the wall in the corner. Yeah. Do you know what that's all repaired now? Of, it's all it, uh, I heard like they were doing it. Basic walkway now, it's very. It was a cliff we were climbing, it was over 100 metres up, but you're walking around a wee small edge 
and parts of it there's nothing at all. You know, there might be a wee steel beam this thin, you know, where the paths all fallen through and you have to then walk across it. But you're, there's a wee thin bit of wire that goes around the cliff and it's anchored in every so often. And you, the Via Ferrata kit you have in, you clip a, a carabiner onto it, you have two, and then every time you come to a boat, you can clip, clip, clip. Mm -hmm. So you're walking around, you are attached, but you're thinking to yourself, how many years has this been hooked in? Yeah. And maybe a wee part of the wire is rusty or something, and you're like, this is not going to hold me if I fall. So there's all that <coughs> in your head. But it gives you a wee bit of security, but mm -hmm. the first time we did it, and we were crawling around, like hugging the cliff, petrified, you're not, you're good with heights, but Johnny and I aren't. But we would have been in that kind of flow state, yeah. kind of going around, and then when, when it's done, like you feel like you're wrecked because yeah. you've had all, just constant adrenaline. You feel like you've you need to go to bed. But it's funny, even like the second or third time we went around that, you were just walking then. Yeah, and at you're that taking point, almost like a few more chances and chances, being a bit more. You were walking it without clipping in at all, mm -hmm. so if you fell, you were dead. <laughs> classic <laughs> board, classic board. Board. Classic board. <laughs> like, You were wanting to crawl down the holes in the path. Below. The there was four people who died on that. Do you remember they did a zip line or something? There used to be a zip line and that collapsed. So there were four people yeah. who see zip line together. And as they were going across this massive canyon, you're probably talking 100 plus meters drop into rocks in a, a river. And these four people went together thinking this would be cool if we did it. In but a, I, in there was the four of them, but did three of them not go and one of them stayed behind? Because there was no room or something? And he had the watch. And he watched his three mates. Mm. The zip line eventually. Was it the anchor? The anchor came out at the far side. Yeah, and basically it was all plummeted yeah. into the rocks. There's a thingy for them there, like a plaque. Yeah, more Every time you walk around, yeah. you see it. Yeah. Yeah. Was I there mean, not yes. some story of uh, that, really. when you were there? Don't be an idiot. Tell that one was it not really like forgotten or whatever. Oh, I remember we were. Afterwards. So you're up, you're up on the path, which is about it was 100 meters up. Yeah, so it's at least 100 meters up, but the path is maybe twice the width of that table, so maybe a meter, and then you've got the drop. But you can then sport climb from the path further up the cliff. Mm -hmm. So sport climbing is where there's anchors in the cliff, and you then clip in as you climb. So if you fall, you're always going to pivot on the most recent anchor point that you've clipped into. And I was belaying you, which means I was at the bottom watching, so if more um, falls, I then use my rope and the belay to kind of stop him from falling further. But you hit the crux of the climb, which is the hardest part, and it was like, ah, oh, I don't think I can do it. So you came down, and then instead of us switching ropes, so I was on the your rope, you just tied into your belay on your side, and I would start to climb in mine. So basically, the pivot was here, you were belaying here, and I was climbing and unclipping the sport, the bolts, and the sport anchors as I went. So when I got to the crux of the climb, there was one pivot at the top that was holding me but no other bolt on the way down, which is, anyone who climbs, if you've watched this, probably thinks we're absolute idiots for doing that, <laughs> which we were. So basically I had one anchor holding me from falling down and then further. So was it tw I think it was a 20 meter climb. Plus 100. Yeah, 100 yeah. below that, so 120 meters. 120 meters. And I went to then, I wanted to look for a handhold above the crux, and I went, reached up and just instinctively grabbed the carabiner that was anchoring me in and the gate was open, and my thumb opened the gate, and I panicked, and kind of all my weight came on it then. <laughs> and a carabiner has a wee clip like that, and you imagine the gate's now open, and it slipped, and then caught on the edge of the bolt. <clears throat> so that bit of metal on the carabiner was holding me 120 metres up a cliff, by one one arm. Because I pulled up the seat, check for a handhold. Uh, you imagine how that felt when your heart started pumping? And the worst part of that is that you sweat more then yeah. as well, didn't you? And then you sweat, sweat more right on the rock. Right, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that makes worse. me feel weird right yeah. now. Yeah. So it was immediately, yeah. you know, it obviously managed yeah. to get it back in, but straight back down again. That was the last climb I did in that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely on that part of the cliff anyway. Yeah. Was that why you were so distracted and uptight when you left your cereal bowl out? <laughs> no, we're going there. Aren't we? <laughs> Quite possibly. <laughs> These two was that our first feud, first proper feud. I had a major it argument that trip. There was basically a cereal bowl was left out in the cabin, and there was one <laughs> Cheerio <laughs> left. <laughs> <laughs> one in the bowl. And they had, <laughs> but someone casually said, oh, "I'll wash your bowl there, would you?" Um, but I think it was a week. Of, it was like or a couple of days of constantly like, washing each other's dishes, and that just got as well. Like the intensity of yeah. climbing and 
adrenaline and all, he probably were like tired and more likely to argue, but it's like, oh, where's that ball before we head out? He's like, oh, that's just your ball. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's definitely your ball. And then I was like, listen, I would never leave a Cheerio in the bowl. <laughs> I would always eat every single Cheerio. <laughs> and that was a good argument, to be fair. I just wasn't accepting it. <laughs> <laughs> and it just compounded and we ended up just screaming at each other. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't know. Who, I actually I still couldn't tell you who it actually is. I'm going to say it probably was me. <laughs> hey, <laughs> ten years later. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had a huge argument over that. Closure. Yeah. Which you would, we would never argue about something so stupid ever. Mm. But it must have been the intensity of the trip and stuff. Yeah. yeah. You do that. But still friends, still friends. Yep. Um, so what, what do you guys think? Where's the line mm. between sport and risk? Um, and has anyone else ever had any near-death experiences? We've heard one from Andy, one from Mort. What about you guys? Mm, I don't think I have, no. no. Definitely not within sport. I've definitely mm. not had any near-death experiences. So. I suppose that's a good thing. Yeah. And, but what do you think? So, you know, you have the like of Alex Honnold now, who's doing free solo, which if anyone doesn't know what that is, that's basically rock climbing now without any ropes, without any clips. Basically just you and the rock and whatever, a chalk bag. If you fall, 100% that's the end of you. Do you know how tall El, Ta- El Capitan is? It's oh, but it's... 3,000 feet. 3,000 feet, yeah. So Al- Alex Honnold yeah, recently free soloed a rock face called El Capitan, which <coughs> is in Yosemite. Um, it's 3,000 foot up, and he climbed the entire thing without ropes in under four hours. <coughs> um, but you even imagine climbing a cliff for four hours without falling? Yeah. yeah. Even if you had all the safety yeah. nets in the world, mm-hmm. and someone came to you and said, do that for a million quid. Yeah. I would, pr- I would fall like I it's couldn't still, do it. It's still incomprehensible on a rope. Never yeah. mind on a yeah. yeah. The whole thing, <coughs> like we've sort of a bit of experience in it, but I think even with that, we couldn't grasp like what that's like. <coughs> yeah. I feel like I can't deny it, but mm-hmm. totally. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. It's so crazy. Like, is it? Is it stupid? Yeah. And he says, yeah. He they actually did uh, an MRI in his brain in that documentary. If anyone's seen it mm. of of that whole climb. And his whatever part of his brain, the amygdala, 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 one of those, um, doesn't light up as much on his on the part of his brain. So, so that, that it's the part of the brain that processes fear. So he's actually broken. That's why I can do it. He's probably developed that. Do you think, or do you think he was born with that? Maybe he maybe had it to a certain extent that attracted him, and then it's developed. Maybe mm-hmm. who knows? Yeah. It's yeah. Desensitized to yeah. fear. So he needs a lot more to get his kick than the average human mm. kind of thing. But to put that into perspective, I know last week we chatted a wee bit when you were talking about Simone Biles and her achievements, um, and then we, we mentioned the Roger Bannister, the first sub four mile, that's his name, am I right? I think so, yeah. Um, and then how suddenly you've got loads of people doing that, and maybe potentially there'll be other people doing this triple twist Simone Biles did. To put in perspective, so it, um, the very first person to climb El Capitan, the rock face, um, I think it took them 47 days and they did that with ropes and anchors. And, and they was, were sleeping on the cliff? Yeah, they were basically climbing up, down again, going up, going a wee bit further and whatnot. And it was, I think I would written it down, uh, 1958, Warren Harding took him 47 days. The second ascent then, three years later, Royal Robbins took him seven days. And then now you have Alex Honnold, who's doing it in under four hours without any ropes, albeit what sixty years later, fifty years later, whatever. Which isn't that long. Yeah. It. It's insane. Unreal. So it's like yeah, that's, what, that's what's one the, generation. Yeah. yeah. From the limit of human performance, you know. Next people will just be able to jump. Whole, uh, <laughs> just jump up. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty crazy. Um, but an interesting fact that I actually came across um, about El Capitan is illegal the base jump there. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Do you know anyone who's base jumps off El Cap? Yeah, you hear a lot. Of, there's a lot of people get arre- arrested by the Rangers. Yeah, um, they'll be there. <coughs> um, so I know when you say illegal, it probably doesn't mean a lot to the base jumping community. This no, sort of tend to do with the one. Yeah. But um, there was a fella who had base jumped, um, and the park Rangers they see you base jumping, they come out to sort of get you. Um, and he ended up he, he, he tried to get you. <laughs> Yogi Bear and you know, <laughs> Um, he tried to get away from the Rangers and ended up drowning in a lake. So there's this whole debate about, well, basically you've 
essentially caused his death because we're not allowed to base jump. So then there was a, a protest. It's a bit blurry lines, but there was a protest organised. Then uh, people were going to go and base jump and then prove that it could be done safely. Um, and then ironically, they died. the person who did that actually ended up dying during the the protest. There's a video of her going in this now as well. Possibly, yeah. yeah. It's one of things you can't laugh at. Yeah. John Davis was her name. Yeah, um, there's a video of her going in. She's wearing like black really. and white stripes, and you see her right to the yeah. point of impact. Yeah. Um, wow. Just sort of ruined that protest. Yeah. I suppose that's the end of that. That's the name on that one. Yeah. Yeah. 30 fatalities um, so far on. El Capitan. From, from climbing or base jumping? Uh, I think that's just in general. Just so overall? Yeah, must be a couple from base. Um, pretty nuts. Um, anything else to say about skydiving and base jumping? No. No? Talk but you're, you're talking about going back to it. Oh yeah, when I'm 30, um, which is only what, five, six months now, so right. planned out. What are you doing you for your 30? Not skydiving with you. Definitely not Thompson. Thompson. <laughs> 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 Which in just as dangerous. That's probably <laughs> just as dangerous. More risky. More risky. <laughs> the brilliant thing is for you is because your triplets, it's always like that sort of emerging. You can do like something big. There's one left. There's always going to be another one if one of them dies. <laughs> There's that too. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be something big. Yeah. Um, Andy was going to do our book review this week. We're going to add another book to the White Wolf Library. As he. I forgot to do it last week. Yeah, and I didn't even prepare for this. But <coughs> this, is, this is the book I've read a few times now. I think it's maybe my third go at it now. It's kind of a book that's really easy to pick up and just jump in. Do you read a lot? Do you? I thought that said onions. That's why I laughed so much. I thought it said super freak onions. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, well, it's a like, cooking book. <laughs> <laughs> super freak onions. Ways to cook onions. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, probably not. I've read some of these. I've read it yeah, yeah. as well, yeah. and they have a podcast as well. Um, but it's basically about like <clears throat> a lot of it's like stats and stuff, but in an interesting way. It's not boring. It can kind of link a lot of interesting things together that you wouldn't normally maybe think about. Um, a couple of examples of have, have written down is one of the first ones. Did you say the name of the book there? Super Freakonomics. Yeah. It's a sequel book to Freakonomics. Um, it's sold millions of copies. Um, very popular book. Um, Stephen D. Levitt and Stephen Dubner, if anyone's interested in looking that up. Um, one of them to talk about in this book is drunking, or drunk walking is more dangerous than drunk driving. And they take all the stats and put it together and explain it all to you. Um, and it basically says if you live a mile away from your house and you're at say a New Year's Eve party and you want to walk home drunk, you're eight times more likely to die than if you get into your car and drive that same mile. And put that, they put that all together <laughs> with like interesting stats and things. Um, they basically take the amount of people who die in traffic. So we should drunk drive is what you're saying? Well, they, they specifically say we do not advocate <laughs> drunk driving but here are the stats and this is what the stats indicate. Mm. But they do that with loads of stuff as well. And there's another one I thought was interesting, sumo wrestlers. I know nothing about sumo wrestling, but apparently, according to this book, if you win eight times or whatever, it kind of, you reach a standard in sumo wrestling that people want to achieve. So the stats are sumo wrestlers who say won seven matches and lost seven, they always win 80% of their next match. And um, when typically, the stats say they should only win 48.7% of their next match. Basically what happens is the people who have 8 matches won already, they have nothing really to lose because they've reached this standard in sumo wrestling and they then um, collude with the person who they're fighting against and they allow them to win is what the stats suggest. Unintentionally or like? Intentionally it's fixed, it's match, fixed. match fixing. Um, so what, is that like you get a different colored diaper or something. <laughs> 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 I, I should look into what that status is or something, but yeah. Yeah, sumo yeah, wrestling, yeah, it's yeah. something good that people want to achieve. Um, <laughs> and that was the stats. And then whenever all these allegations came out by the media that kind of alerted everyone to this, then suddenly the stats for that match suddenly dropped back down to 50% again, which just even further kind of proves that it was being fixed. But basically the whole book will take interesting stories like that, give you all of the, the stats, put it together, and it's 
like I said, it's something you can just pick up, read, pick any chapter because they're all kind of separate mm. points and just get stuck into and read. You kind of almost reach a bit of flow state with that because you're so interested by it and you know, it's really, really good. So I would highly recommend it. There's some, I remember there's a good one, it's been years since I read it, but something about traffic or something, wasn't it? The one where they analyzed something about traffic. I can't remember sure the specifics. I can't remember. And then maybe, what was the other one? Something about crime rates. That was sort of maybe like a surprising one yeah, the yeah. The, but there was something with crime rates and this, I just read it, I can't actually obviously remember what it was. But it's sort of all like, sort of, there's maybe like a surface level understanding, but then they go really deep into the stats and underlying mechanisms, yeah. and then it's like, oh, right, a surprising conclusion yeah. this time. So You're it's usually surprised by it, like yeah. letting all of our prisoners out would decrease crime or something like that. There's a typical kind of. Yeah. And they'll explain it all, and then by the end of the chapter, you're like, that actually makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool, sounds okay. interesting. And a good podcast, as you said, mm -hmm. the podcast for the mm -hmm. people who don't really go want to read as much. As I couldn't even read the title, I'll probably stick to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> super, super Onions, it's called. <laughs> super the, Onions. The podcast, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where's super, the yeah. White Wolf Library? Is it upstairs? Uh, just behind you there. This is it, yeah. uh, <laughs> this, this one book. We'll build that up for a second now. We've got a library upstairs, time we'll but don't read yeah. anything, so we'll have to rejig it. Yeah. So yeah, that, that book will be available in the library. We now have two books there. We'll be adding <laughs> a third next week. Um, maybe Benji can review one. Oh. Put a bit of pressure on. Could you read a book in the next week? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Johnny Moore, are you reading any books at the minute? Um, what's the last one I've been reading? I have been reading quite a few lately, but a lot of them are military based stuff and that kind of thing. Um, all quite sort of well known stuff. Um, like autobiography kind of thing? Autobiography and stuff like that, yeah. Um, there's a new one out, obviously everyone's going to know him because he's from the show SAS Who Dares Wins. Mark Billingham has just released his book there last month. So that's always been a big interest of mine. I could never join um, the army because I have asthma and that was a straight up no for the medical. So. I think it was a bit of a missed call in there, something I would have loved to have joined when I was younger, but um, yeah, that's what I'm reading at the moment. So Mark Billingham. Um, I actually haven't started, but I just got it. So. Very good, very good. Cool, cool. Nice one. Um, yeah, that pretty much concludes our second episode of the White Wolf podcast. Mm. We're not talking about Unless anything else to say? I mean, what time are we at? I don't know, it's 20, 20 past one. one. But do you want to cut it down, you know? That's what I just want to talk about. Keep going for it. How long have we been going for? You got something to say? That's how long have we been going for? 20.5, wouldn't you? Throwing a bit of crossfit here? Sure. Yeah, Benji did 20.5 yesterday. He's going to give us a few tips. Okay. How'd it go? How'd you pick it up? What is it? Because I don't know what it is. So, 20.5 is 40 ring muscle ups, 80 oh. calories on the row, and 120 wall balls. Um, I thought that I was a games level athlete last night. Um, and it's like, let's do this. In that order? Right. So you can, oh, sorry. So you can do whatever way you want. So, like, you can break it up, partition it however you want. That's unusual uh, for the open. Yeah. And, uh, which it's is quite good, interesting. Yeah. It's sort of I seen my muscle ups, and I was like, yes, finally, I can maybe crawl back some ground here. And then there was like, Rowan, ah, wall balls, <laughs> ah. Um, but. And then whatever they said, you can do it whatever way you want. I was like, oh, dear goodness. Because I thought 40 muscle ups. 40 muscle ups, i <laughs> Like, nobody's going to get. Them, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and I'll be, I'll be all right. But you, know, you can do whatever you want. So I started the year we we probably like WhatsApp group and all, and we're like, so it's come out strategies, how you do it, what. I think it's very individual. Like it's it obviously like based on the individual. It, it's completely down to how you split that up. You know, like if you haven't got muscle ups, like you could go is like let's just get through the wall balls and. Um, Rowan as fast as you can because they give you your split, you know. Yeah, so like they're the the guarantee because everybody can do those really. Um, so like they're really you can't leave any of them on the table. If you leave them on the table, you're like losing reps. Um, it's a twenty minute cap, by the way. Um, so and then either you can get like if somebody knows they can get that or they might get one and they're gonna get the first muscle up. It's like right, okay, you do try that while you're fresh try like you know one two minutes of like getting one maybe two get them out of the way and then just hammer the next bit if you know you're probably going to get quite a few but you don't know if you're going to finish it then it's like right do you again do them while you're fresh and then move on to the rest of them try and finish them out you know at the end or like scatter them through um 
or if you know you're going to finish it and it's like right how do you gain that um, how did you break it up so I thought I was like I'll probably finish this I thought but just didn't know how to break it up then I thought okay Dave sent me well there was a few of us there was a few different ones Dave was like oh we'll go do like a 5 then 10, 15 on the wall balls depending on capacity so if you're going to get through them and then like say 5 calories on the rower and I was like nah I'm going to I'm going to big lad this I was like, I, my first initial plan was do 40 muscle ups and then, <laughs> and then, and then, and then just throw one wall ball to the end. So that was, I'm um, really glad I didn't try that. Um, <laughs> because, you know, oh, you can do 20. Let's just do that in two sets. <laughs> um, do you know, no worries. The, like, so that was really do you do 20 muscle ups? What do you say? Can you? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Hashtag humble bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I was like, right, yeah, bro, me, well, me and Stuart were talking about it then last night, and again, probably shouldn't listen to what Stuart does, because me and him are very different approach to this, um, as well, but anyway, we were like, eight rounds of five ring muscle-ups, then 15 wall balls, 10 calorie row, it would have been like 5, 10, 15, but like, we swapped the row and wall ball around, because, like, the row's really going to be the recovery mm-hmm. thing, you know, it's like, get off the wall balls, and then so. just sit on the rower. Um, and that went well. Started that it was like that. That we based that on like one minute thirty rounds. I was like one minute thirty. Yeah, I'll get twelve minutes class. This will be class. Um, I did my first round in one thirty one, um, and nothing else was close to that. After the but I started out first round was all right, and I got three rounds of the four five ring muscle ups, and then the weed started to come off the bus, and that um, dropped one rep on the, the muscle ups. So I had five rounds of four ring muscle ups then. The wall balls were just horrendous. Fifteen was way too big a set for me, um, and then the rowing. Johnny said he's never seen me row like that. Anyone rows slow? Uh, <laughs> Anyone? I, I was rowing like a girl um, at one point, which uh, is an insult to girls, perhaps. Well, most most girls row faster. Yeah, that's it. That's what right, he said. Most girls row faster than me uh, last night. So I think I was rowing like six hundred at one point. So that was class. Um, I was like, I, I started and I was like, as long as I keep twelve hundred, <laughs> so literally half of that. Um, but you still you still got to finish. Well, yeah, still finishing. Like, which is team, impressive. Anyone who finishes in that workouts. But now, like, well. yeah, and like I've, we got like a now I know how you, what it feels like, what to do wrong. Like I wouldn't. What to have, do wrong or what to do right? Sorry. <laughs> I would have probably stopped. Like I remember in the middle of it, like Stuart was like, he was doing the fifteen balls. The wall balls would really jack my heart rate, and really I was suffering on. And, like Stuart was like dropped a 10 and I'm in my head he was like I was like he's trying to get me to quit, to get me to quit. <laughs> I'm going to stop I'm not going to stop I'm going to do 20 yeah. I was like I'll do 20 do, do, I'm just going to do them all and then like but obviously he was just trying to help um, and I, but I would have got then I'll slow my row again and I just I was miserable but I know what to do better so I think the, the best thing for me personally is I'm going to do smaller sets like I'm not going to do more than 10s on the wall balls at all I remember doing 10 I was fine but it was actually those next 5 that I really started like gasping for her, you know, it's really, really difficult. Um, and as soon as you started doing that, you know, you can't get a rhythm going. Um, so trying to like set my rounds of like, well, I'm gonna figure out, right, okay, this is what I wanna do. So maybe actually 130 around with way less reps this time, you know, so maybe gonna go, I think I'm gonna try, I think fives and muscle ups is maintainable. Um, so like 10 rounds of either five, 10 wall balls, and then eight calories in the row. Or pretty much what I suggested. Pretty start. much what yeah, you okay. suggested from the start. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is a great, we have a great, me and Dave have a great coach, athlete, and as he said, he tells me to do something and I do the complete opposite and then realise he was right the first time <laughs> um, and then do it again the second time. Um, but it was, yeah, so we'll try something like that. Eat something maybe, or maybe just open with a bigger set of muscle ups, get more of them out of the way. And like, How many would you do? Like, yeah. what would be your biggest set that you could do with the muscle ups? Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Well, 20 you really plus. wanted to? 20 plus? I had to do more than 20. Really? Yeah. I rode in like 19 one day in here and I only got off because I had to, because it was only 20 to do and I had to split them. So, but I don't know if that's a smart idea, like, because you could, like, for the point of it. Mm-hmm. When have you got to do, you when is the submission date? Monday night. So, when are you doing the next one? Monday night. Again, so watch the thing and see how we go. But so that hasn't changed from the February one. It's the same sort of thing. Comes out Friday, Thursday night. Yeah, yeah Thursday night. And then you can go through. 
but I've then tried to do every one this one. I've never really, I was usually one and done, but this one has been Friday, video it, and then look at what I did wrong, and then Pretty do it again on Monday, and every single one has improved. Pretty much drastically. So yeah. I was meant to pick up those rip off blooms twenty five minutes ago. <laughs> well, that, get your blooms. Yeah. In yeah, that case, that's that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Cool. That's us. Let's wrap it up there then. We'll go watch the KSI fight tonight. Ooh. You. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, want to get sweet potato apples? Or what do we call it? Sweet potato place? Back potato. Back potato. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this, this sweet potato. We're going down to the sweet potato.